Yeah, as I mentioned, I don't know if everybody was here. So I am Laura Crew and I am the SIMS project manager for XF and Large Geometry SIMS lines. And today we are very pleased to have the Dr. Jonathan Engel um, to give this a webinar. Um, uh, Jonathan Engel is the SIMS and FIB laboratory manager at Virginia Tech Nano SIMS Characterization and Fabrication Laboratory. He has more than 10 years of characterization experience and uh, his research interests focus heavily on neobium SRF materials, particle accelerator, as well as mechanically alloyed titanium based material. So today he will present a webinar on trust level SIMS quantification of nitrogen and oxygen in neobium for particle accelerator. So Please, Jonathan, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And sorry again for the delay. Oh, it's no problem. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Also, th um, I want to thank you and uh, Mary and, and Sophie for the opportunity to speak today. It's, uh, it's a, a pleasure to talk about my topic, uh, which was um, already introduced. But once again, it's the trace level SIMS quantitation of nitrogen and oxygen and that would be for particle accelerators. Uh, it is not switching slides now. Okay. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So, um, as Laura said, I am the uh, Sims and focused on I am being manager at Virginia Tech, which is located in Blacksburg, Virginia. And for those of you uh, unfamiliar with the geography of Virginia. It's about four hours southwest of Washington, D.C. And um, the facility that I actually work at is called the Nanoscale Characterization and Fabrication Laboratory at Virginia Tech, which is where uh, the Kamika 7F Geo Sims is housed. Uh, the NCFL, or short for um, the Nano Nanoscale Characterization Lab, is host to a lot of other instrumentation as well, uh, predominantly focused on electron microscopy. Um, but my research is based as a joint collaboration between Virginia Tech and the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility, and uh, specifically the team which researches the superconducting radio frequency cavities to improve the operation efficiency of particle accelerators. And Jefferson Lab is no located in Newport News, which is also in Virginia, but um, completely on the opposite side of the state. So particle accelerators um, are often this mythological or mystified in some sense. And that's often because of their size and their power and also their scientific achievements. However, a lot of people would be shocked to realize that they're a lot more common than you would realize. Old CRT TVs are um, one such instance in which this is the case. And they're just small linear accelerators in which a heated element is used to produce electrons, which are then accelerated towards a phosphor screen and a sense gives you an image. Accelerators have um, many different functions and often different size depending on its use. And the large scale accelerators, uh, which are used for research in particle physics, only make up about 1% or so of the particle accelerators that are actually uh, in use. So particle accelerators have often or also been around for about a century now. And the first particle accelerator was uh, dreamt up by Ernest Rutherford in which um, he proposed that if he was able to accelerate a, pro or a proton beam with enough energy, he could cause a lithium atom to split. So he contracted Crockroft and Walton to create the first uh, particle accelerator, uh, which was done in 1932. Uh, essentially, they created a protein, or I'm sorry, a proton beam, which was uh, accelerated, accelerated through a beam tube, which was done by biasing the tubes at a high voltage. The proton beam then impacted the lithium sample, which was found to cause the atom to split and was uh, detected by looking at a, fl or a fluorescent screen with a microscope. And these scientists were later achieved or 
awarded the Nobel Prize for this achievement. Uh, today, modern accelerators operate using radio frequency waves as opposed to biasing the beam tube, and their construction is quite different. So for modern accelerators, uh, these instruments uh, use SRF cavities, which are the heart and soul of the modern accelerator. They consist of niobium, uh, which is cooled to about two degrees Kelvin, which is a good bit below the critical temperature for superconductivity. It's at this point that a resonant radio wave is introduced to create an oscillating electric field. And at a critical and strategic time interval, uh, a charged particle is introduced into the beam tube, which corresponds to the apex of the RF wave. And as the particle travels through the beam tube, it receives an extra little kick as it goes through each assessed cell. And the leading accelerators are multiple kilometers long. So you can imagine that as the time, or about the time that they reach the detector, they can achieve very high energies and velocities. So pictured here is uh, one of the more recent designs uh, for an SRF cavity. This is the current design that's being uh, used for the linear coherent light source, which is currently under construction at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory at Stanford. Uh, the plan here is to combine roughly 3.2 kilometers of cavities uh, to accelerate electrons, and the electrons will be used to impact a target to generate an ultra-bright X-ray beam. Uh, one way that this accelerator will be used is to perform in situ protein mapping. And the thought here is that the X-rays will go through the protein faster than it will uh, destroy the, the molecule due to beam tamp or damage. And so you can map the shape of the protein in real time. So the performance of SRF cavities is uh, governed by the quality factor, and this can be simply thought of as efficiency. This term is just the ratio of energy stored versus energy lost. And since uh, the, it's a ratio, there's no units. Uh, older models, which used uh, copper, uh, normal conducting copper cavities would typically report Q0 values of about 10 to the four, with uh, niobium cavities capable of achieving Q0 values above 10 to the 10. Some of this efficiency gain is inflated due to the cryogenic cost of the niobium cavities. However, the net increase is still about a factor of a thousand times better. Um, for decades, niobium cavities was created with great care to avoid the addition of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. It was thought that it was necessary to have the highest purity to uh, have the best performances. However, more recently, as in about a decade ago, it was serendipitously discovered that the addition of interstitial alloying elements could further or actually increase the efficiency um, if these elements were kept in very low concentrations. And that is because the mean free path or the distance an electron travels uh, free of scattering is reduced. And this has been reported to lower the uh, surface resistance at some critical concentration. And therefore, uh, SIMS was elected as an ideal characterization tool uh, due to its PPM levels of sensitivity and its high surface uh, resolution. So um, since I'm presenting this to a uh, SIMS community, I feel that most people are familiar enough uh, with SIMS. I'm not gonna have to go too much in the background here. So I'll gloss over this just a little bit. Essentially, uh, SIMS uses a primary ion beam, which is in our case, a cesium, and it impacts a sample to generate secondary ions. The secondary ions are extracted and detected in terms of counts. To quantify the data, an implant standard must be first tested to determine the relative sensitivity factor of each impurity element. And due to the differences of the ionization efficiencies um, of, these each, of these elements, um, this has to be done for each impurity species. So on this project, earlier researchers uh, prior to me joining reported RSF values of about 40 or 50% for polycrystalline niobium. And that brings us to the start of my work related to this project. Um, JLab, who um, is the key player for the work that I do, decided that the uncertainty should be about 10%, and others in the SRF community agreed with this. 
So the first topic here focuses on reducing the uncertainty of implant standards. And um, I'd be remiss to say if a lot of what I found uh, had a lot to do with research that was um, reported over the last several de or decades, um, which was mostly reported about semiconductor uh, materials. Um, so you could say that I'm standing on the shoulder of giants, so to speak. Uh, many, of these, uh, many of these projects focuses on semiconductor. However, I'm going to focus on polycrystalline niobium, which proved to be somewhat of a challenge uh, and we sought to investigate this further. So originally the implant standards which were used for this project were often fine grain polycrystalline node. And it could be perceived that using a fine grain material would be beneficial as the standards um, would act as a way to summate or the summation of the data so that all of the individual grains would average out. However, if we look at the crater profiles, we see that um, the bottom is rough, and this is due to preferential sputtering um, due to the varying grain orientations. And so once again, I bring up here the RSF equation, and many of the terms in this equation would be difficult to assign an uncertainty value. However, the uncertainty of the crater depth is something that can be attained and is evident by this profile. Therefore, we assume that the uncertainty measurement of the crater depth would propagate to the RSF equation. So we sought to avoid this issue by analyzing larger grain polycrystalline samples. And in general, the uncertainty resulting from the crater um, bottoms could be somewhat avoided. However, um, there were some other issues that we saw. Some of the adjacent grains next to the grain in which we were analyzing was um, found to have a slope. And this is presumably due to the polishing process, um, either by buffer chemical polishing or uh, electro polishing. So then we decided to, for calibrating the instruments, we decided to just then go to a single crystal um, niobium standard, which now sounds like it should have been a no brainer. And uh, I feel like the semiconductor people um, uh, probably are like, oh, no duh, this is what you should do. But um, this was something that wasn't originally thought up for us. Um, there is some issues with single crystals as well though that we found. And one being that if the uh, surface finish isn't good enough, then you can still have these anomalous RSF values. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So initially the RSF determination of large grain polycrystalline niobium implant standards still showed high uncertainties. And we were still getting roughly the same 40% uncertainty as was reported by other researchers. If uh, the surface was especially smooth from the electro polishing, you could at times mistakenly analyze a, a grain boundary or miss it in the CCD camera. And, but if you're fortunate enough to make sure you avoided all these grain boundaries, even still, the uncertainty was still high. And we chalked this up to be due to the grain orientation differences of, of the polycrystal material. Therefore, we, uh, we tested many different grains and grain orientations by um, performing um, crater profiles of this implant standard of all different types of grain orientations. Um, initially, we saw that there was about equal scatter in the RSF value, which was independent of grain orientation. Um, in a few slides, we're going to revisit this because in this experiment, I didn't find that old grain orientation really mattered. However, there were conditions later on that I did find that the um, grain orientation did, in fact, affect the RSF. So I will be coming back to that. But in terms of this experiment, we determined that the changes in the RSF value were likely due to the surface topography um, as it was, there was step height differences from grain to grain. And analyzing the various implant standards, it was found that the polycrystalline 
implant standards exhibited the highest variation of RSF determinations. Once again, this is not really a surprise, um, but if we go ahead and take a look at L79, which is technically a bicrystal, um, in our case, we only analyzed one grain for this uh, implant standard. L79 had a buffer chemical polish finish, which is uh, notably rougher than an electro polish finish. And for U52, the, uh, this material had an electro polish finish. So we see that the difference between these two samples is essentially just this, uh, the surface roughness. As a result, we see that L79 had a higher uncertainty associated with its analysis as opposed to U52, which had an uncertainty about half of the buffer chemical polish specimen. And this was reported to be below our 10% threshold. So now that we um, kind of determined that topography was important to know and surface roughness as well, and it would appear that those affect the RSF uncertainty, we sought to see if we could further improve these values. Um, the Kamika 7F models, and I also believe some of the newer models are equipped with a dynamic transfer or dynamic transfer contrast aperture. So when surface topography is evident, the trajectory of the secondary ion beam can become wayward. And the DDCA is, uh, can be used to recenter the beam in the secondary column, which uh, presum presumably gives you a more precise result by giving you also a more consistent count rate. On the previous experiment where we analyzed uh, the various different implant standards was repeated by using the DTCA in this case. And it was found that in all cases, the uncertainty would decrease when the DTCA was uh, used to recenter the beam. Most notably, the single crystal with the impeccable finish was uh, observed to achieve RSF uncertainties of about 2%. And even our polycrystalline standards were producing uh, values approaching roughly 10% or so. Um, sometimes the topography issues cannot be resolved using the DTCA if uh, they are senior, severe enough. And issues um, regarding sample holders seem to be in one such case in which uh, they can't be resolved. So in this paper, we take a look at some other factors uh, which would help you improve the um, RSF determination. So shown here is a loaning animation for a generic uh, Kamika style sample folder, which is uh, used for our 7F. The samples are placed on a thin faceplate and, and, and held there by compressing springs in between the samples and a back plate. So it was discovered that the springs uh, could supply enough force to cause the faceplate to deflect. And this, could, this causes differences in the working distance and subsequently would cause a difference in the RSF value. By varying the number of samples or the number of springs that were used, um, it was found that you could observe this effect in the by monitoring the count rate of for the niobium signal. The DTCA was used for this experiment. However, we saw that there was real, really no effect, no gain by using it. By monitoring the matrix counts, we see that the signal was reduced two to three times just by removing two of the springs. This also was found to propagate to the RSF value, which, was, which showed an inverse proportionality between the number of springs and the RSF value. So we wanted to determine if uh, the spring force was actually enough to cause the faceplate to bend or if there was some other um, phenomenon that was happening here. Therefore, we used a static stress simulator. Uh, we designed these holders in a, a Fusion 360 and used the static stress simulator in the package to, um, to simulate this effect. The spring force uh, can vary as a function of the distance compressed. So we used a load cell on an instron and compressed the springs to the proper distance in which we found that the springs would supply about two newtons of force um, each 
using these constraints, we calculated the face or that the faceplate could deflect or deflect about 10 microns or so for the standard Kanika holder. And therefore we designed a new holder, which would reinforce the faceplate with support ribs. Um, so what we really found here is that the standard holders uh, that you typically get are great for analyzing irregular geometries and such and, and larger samples. However, um, if you're doing a routine quantitative analysis, I would suggest that you would design or create a more standard sample size and design a custom holder in which you can avoid the face plate deflection. Um, here we have a table in which uh, we used a silicon implant standard because we were trying to preserve our niobium standards. Um, however, we found that this was sufficient to determine the effectiveness of using our new holder. In this case, we were able to achieve uncertainties below 1%. However, I point out that this was also for a nearly perfect um, silicon implant standard. So with resolving this one major issue, we were still finding anomalous data points where the niobium signal was reporting unusually high signals. And this anomaly was not only found in implant standards, but it was also found in the experimental samples as well. And with the experimental samples, we see that the niobium signal, when, when we hit these um, strange conditions, the niobium signal would spike about an order of magnitude. And equally, we saw that the impurity signal would also decrease. And so once again, we revisited the idea that grain orientation was responsible for this, but we then hypothesized that the grain orientation with the respect to the primary beam was responsible for this effect. Um, since there is you know, a beam tilt with the primary beam, this is somewhat hard to prove. So we um, designed an experiment, which was somewhat difficult and time consuming, but ultimately it provided evidence that ion channeling was responsible for the inflated niobium signals and RSF values. Here we created um, a new sample holder, which was capable of rotating at 360 degrees, uh, normal to the viewing direction. EBSD was performed on the bicrystal sample to determine the grain orientation of all the faces. Uh, a depth profile was performed in 15 degree increments to determine if there is any condition in which a stray RSF value would be found. And in fact, it, it was discovered. So knowing um, that the beam incident or the incident beam angle was offset about 24 degrees from normal and knowing that the grain orientations of the face and sides of the grains or what they were, a simulation of this experiment could be performed to show what the grain orientation would be with respect to the primary beam. And the animations here illustrate this uh, simulation. So the top row here, which was uh, the red grain, the or the 001 grain, um, when during the rotational experiment here, it was found that there was never a condition in which the 001 grain would cross another cardinal axis. Therefore, um, we see that the RSF value was consistent across this experiment. However, with the bottom row, which was a uh, analysis performed on what would appear to be a random oriented grain, we found that when we rotated the sample that there was a condition in which the RSF spiked. And in, we can see that with the simulation, we're about right here, we're looking upon the edge of the cube, which would be uh, corresponding to a 101 cardinal axis when rotated. And this was exactly where the RSF was reported to have had the higher value. So ion channeling is a phenomenon where the primary ions glide through the interstitial space and become embedded much deeper into the material. Um, the results show that there is a slower sputter rate and 
um, this is evident with all cardinal axes. So what we wanted to see here is we wanted to see that if it was just the cardinal axes that produced this effect, or did we want to see if there were other random orientations that would produce this effect? So um, focus ion beam was used to perform this analysis on several different grains to monitor the sputter rates as a function of grain orientation. And you can see the result in the bottom right image, which is a heat map of sputter rate as a function of grain orientation. In general, as was expected, we see that the ion channeling conditions of the um, cardinal axes produced um, slower sputter rates, but we also saw that there were a few conditions which appeared to be somewhat random that also produced ion ch channeling conditions. Um, what we found in the lesson learned here is that with our conditions, a 24 um, degree beam tilt, is that if you perform your analyses on, you know, do EVSD beforehand and perform your analyses on a um, cardinal axis with respect to the beam or with respect to the normal, your viewing direction, then you can avoid these conditions just by analyzing only cardinal axes because there will never be a condition in which the cardinal axis or, or a rotational condition in which the cardinal axis will be analyzed. So with the knowledge of how to improve our RSF determinations, we wanted to see if we can use this information to investigate real world challenges associated with producing SRF cavities. In this case, we sought to investigate um, contamination issues regarding the preparation of heat treatments of the SRF cavities. So I haven't talked a whole lot about the, the cavities themselves, but um, I'll go ahead and do so now. Now, OVM SRF cavities are created through a number of steps, and in the interest of time, um, I won't go into detail with every step. However, once the cavities are formed in a needle, they undergo a heat treatment process in which the interstitial alloying can occur. Currently, nitrogen doping is the most widely accepted and used method for interstitial alloying. However, as of 2021, action alloying has emerged as a promising technique to replace nitrogen doping. Both of these uh, processes occur in a vacuum furnace, which um, in which the cavities are heated to some ideal temperature, held at that temperature, and then at some desired time, cooled back to ambient. In the case of nitrogen doping, a typical baking recipe may uh, have a cavity heated to 800 or 900 degrees Celsius to grow nitrides on the surface. And once these nitrides are grown, they are then subsequently removed by electropolishing to leave only the interstitial nitrogen behind. During uh, this process, a, a small six by 10 millimeter witness sample is placed in a cavity to experience the baking procedure. The furnace caps are applied to the ends of the cavity to block monocyte contamination. The use of the furnace caps uh, is proposed to prevent contamination from the furnace environment. However, its effectiveness has never really been demonstrated. And to identify the contamination, a combination of mass spectra and depth profiles were, were acquired. The SRF uh, materials, or for SRF materials, it's most critical to analyze the top 100 nanometers uh, or less regarding the contamination. This is called the RF active layer. It's this layer that's responsible for, for, um, for transferring the surface currents. A typical scan of about zero to 200 AMU would take too long to properly characterize this region. Therefore, the analyses for this were performed in 15 AMU increments and multiple scans were compiled into uh, one plot. In this case, very accurate quantitation does not really possible. Um, however, the data is reported as semi-quantitative for comparison purposes. The effectiveness of the furnace caps has um, always been widely debated since they've been used. So the question exists, do furnace caps actually work? Ideally, these caps would prevent the contamination while allowing, or allowing 
for the transfer of low pressure nitrogen gas into the interior of the cavity. The mass spectra show um, fewer and smaller peaks pertaining to the carbon and oxygen when the caps were used. A quantitation showed that carbon and oxygen were predominantly present for the um, sample which was exposed to the furnace environment. Where the, um, for the sample which was protected by the furnace caps inside the uh, beam tube of the cavity, this sample um, showed a much higher nitrogen content with much lower contamination resulting from carbon and oxygen. So yes, um, we can answer the question that the furnace caps um, not only appear to be effective, but also prudent for the production of a clean cavity. Since um, the nitrides are removed post or post processing, it's important to understand the diffusion behavior of um, nitrogen and carbon, as well as oxygen, into, of these into the interstitial sites. And the furnace cap experiment, we see that the carbon, which is considered detrimental to the cavity performance, will remain in higher concentrations deeper into the sample as compared to the nitrogen. Additionally, the carbon appears to reduce the concentration at depths where the nitrogen layer or the nitride layer would be removed by the um, electro polishing. So once again, it is clear to see that the, uh, the importance of using furnace caps to protect uh, the cavities from contamination. So I've already mentioned a little bit about nitrogen doping, but I also want to talk about oxygen alloying. And oxygen alloying is another interstitial alloying technique, which was discovered less than two years ago. Sam Posen at Fermilab first noticed this effect in what he called an mid-tea bake. And Ido from KEK, through a series of experiments, further observed that the, the process was real and noted that the performance um, increases at roughly 30 or 300 degrees Celsius. Our experiments confirmed this phenomenon and through a paper in APL written by one of our team members, uh, Eric Lechner, uh, we were able to show that this phenomenon was predictable and also could be modeled. We have been using uh, the SIMS data to fine tune these models so that one day we may be able to link a specific recipe to predict how the cavity will perform. The oxygen alloying process occurs at roughly uh, 300 degrees Celsius, which is far below the doping temperatures um, or the nitrogen doping temperatures. Also, there's no need for an external uh, gas as the native oxide is dissolved and diffuses into the bulk. And it's at these temperatures that the diffusion coefficient for oxygen is higher than that of carbon and nitrogen. This means that the oxygen content it can be selectively increased um, via the dissolution and diffusion process. Theoretically, the lower temperatures would limit the risk of contamination. And in practice, we found that this was mostly true. The nitrogen dope sample showed much higher carbon and oxygen content, which was kept minimal for the oxygen alloy sample. On the other hand, more metallic con or contamination existed for oxygen alloy sample. Presumably, uh, this is because that there is no post-processing electropolishing step for the oxygen alloy samples. Um, however, it could be that in the future, if we were to add a brief electropolishing step, it would be helpful to remove some of this contamination if it proved to be problematic. So most importantly for this, um, how does this affect the performance of a cavity? And there is no doubt um, that the presence of contamination will affect the RF or the RF performance properties of interstitial alloy. However, a direct uh, correlation between contamination and cavity performance has proven to be difficult to uh, correlate. Cavity HE. Uh, 353, which is in the top left here, uh, is one of the best performing cavities ever produced. And even still, we see that as with about 2,000 
part per million of carbon surviving the alloying process. Where the cleanest cavity, SC11, which is on the bottom right uh, plot here, initially poor, performed somewhat pro poorly. The performance was found to have improved after a nitric acid rinse um, was included into the process. Even though this was still somewhat of a mystery, it's likely that this can all be avoided by switching to oxygen alloy as we are continuing to fine tuning that process. So in summary here, we were able to improve our quantitation methods and we have been shown to uh, be able to achieve RSF uncertainties of about 10% and sometimes better when using uh, single crystals. Um, this is largely a result of using the DTCA and also by avoiding ion channel. We were also able to use this information to now perform routine measurements of witness samples, as well as to um, perform experiments on other samples as um, indicated by our contamin or contamination analysis. So uh, with that, I have a few acknowledgements that I'd like to point out with um, some of the, the JLab crew, which would uh, be Michael Kelly, Charlie Reese, Ari Palczewski, Eric Lechner. Um, and also I wanna give a big thanks to uh, Fred Stevie, who um, was, uh, a very big mentor to me um, when I was uh, learning Sims, as well as Natalie Sievers, uh, who helped uh, get me started with uh, performing Sims uh, experiments. So with that, I thank you all for your attention.